Hello, it's uh, Mike Breen again. It's great to be with you, friends and family of the Order of Mission. Today, my task given to me by people who know better than me uh, is to share with you really the fundamental, the, um, the, the, the fabric of the theology that supports the life of the Order of Mission. So to do that, I, I want to just explore these two great themes that many of us have thought about long and hard, uh, but um, perhaps some will need a refresher or others will need an introduction. I'm going to be looking at the two great themes of covenant and kingdom. And of course, what they refer to in the Bible are our relationship first with God and then our call to represent him. So, covenant and kingdom are about relationship and representation. We relate to God as he calls us into a relationship with him, and we represent him. So let's look at what it means to understand that from a biblical worldview. At the very beginning of the Bible, we read in Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth, and as the crown of his creation, he creates human beings to bear his image. Certainly within the cosmology of the day, the idea would have been that God as the king of the universe was addressing his royal household, his royal court. The people of his household, of course, are the angelic beings. In other religions that were not monotheistic, those other heavenly beings would have been gods. But within the monotheism of the Bible, those heavenly beings are understood to be created beings and therefore are angelic beings. And God addresses them when he said, let us make man in our image. He addresses them. He uses the first person plural of royalty, which uh, many of you will be familiar with who live in countries with the monarchy. They often use that as their way of communicating. And as he says that, of course, there's this breathless amazement in the court of heaven that God would do such a remarkable thing. So as he crowns his creation with the, with the, the creation of man and woman for the first time, he sets his image upon them. Perhaps the best way to understand image is to understand it uh, by way of the metaphor that is used in the first few chapters of Genesis, that the metaphor of God fashioning, fashioning us out of the clay of the earth. He leaves, as it were, the imprint of his hand upon us. And that imprint is always intended to be filled by the hand that made it. And so the idea of image really relates both to relationship and to representation. When, when any other creature within the universe looks upon a human being, they should see the representation, the image of God. As well as that, every human being knows that in bearing the image of God, they live in relationship with God because the handprint upon them is filled with the hand that made it. And so we're designed to be no further from God than his arm's length. That anthropomorphic language, of course, is very familiar to both the Old and the New Testament, where God is uh, not understood to have a human form, but is represented as such so that we can understand what it is that's going on. The two big words that, uh, that I've referred to already that represent these two great themes are covenant and kingdom. Covenant means that we are one with God. Our relationship is not a distant relationship. Our relationship is not a passing relationship. Our relationship is not any other relationship other than a relationship of oneness. We are one with God. And in being one with God, we now have 
the call and the capacity to represent him. Kingdom um, is the usual way in which the words, both in Hebrew and in Greek, are translated into English. Perhaps the better translation would be kingship. Covenant and kingship are right the way through the Bible. God is the king of the universe. He's called us into a covenant relationship with himself, and he represents his kingship through his chosen and called out representatives, you and I. Now, of course, when you see that story unfold in the first few chapters of Genesis, it's marvelous to even imagine that God would do that with, with creatures that he's made from the dust of the earth. But in portraying the creation, God saw fit also to portray and to articulate the, 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 the trouble that we're in. Because the perfection that was known at the beginning has now been lost to us. Human beings have pulled away from the hand that filled the imprint. And as we pulled away, we immediately felt naked. As we pulled away, we immediately felt vulnerable and afraid. As we pulled away, we immediately knew that we had transcended the basic realm in which we were to function. We've, we've stepped over the boundary of the relationship that was to sustain us. And so immediately you see both Adam and Eve feeling naked, feeling afraid, and feeling failures. Guilt, shame, and fear filled their hearts almost instantaneously. Well, of course, that breaking and severing of the relationship meant that we could no longer represent God. And we see the pain in God's heart as he speaks out the consequences of such a rebellious act, both to Adam and Eve and to their tempter, the serpent, who in the unfolding revelation of scripture is revealed as Satan our great adversary. God says that the consequences of breaking that first relationship, breaking that first covenant, is that we're now expelled from his presence. But God being who he is and having a heart full of love towards us, of course, bends all of his will to draw us back into a relationship where we freely choose to be one with him again. And we see him working towards that end in the early chapters of Genesis, culminating in the story of Abraham and Sarah. There, in the story of Abraham and Sarah, for the first time in the Bible, we see a family fashioned around a call to have a covenant with God where we're one with him. And as, as that family is one with God, so that family begins to represent God. It's a, a marvelous story and um, beautifully told and reveals to us the elements that are necessary within covenant. Kingship uh, will be more fully articulated in the, in the later story of the first book of the Bible, uh, the, the other great story of the first book, which is the story of Joseph. And I describe them as the great stories, not because I want to diminish the other characters of the other stories in Genesis, but simply that when you look at the, the verses of Genesis, the ones um, of Abraham and the ones of Joseph are the ones that basically take up most, most of the text of that first book. And so these are the principal stories. And um, as the principal stories, they reveal to us the two principal themes that will flow through scripture from the first page to the end. Covenant and kingdom. And there with Abraham, we see covenant articulated. And what, what Abraham does is he serves God's purposes. He submits to God. And as he submits to God, he submits in a way that is most familiar to the scriptures. What he, what he does is to submit to God by telling God what it is that's in his heart and in his mind. You see, submission is not simply about doing what it is that another person wants you to do. Submission 
is about actually saying to the one to whom you're submitted what it is that you have in your heart to say. And um, you see this most particularly and uh, most beautifully in the conversation that Abraham has with God about Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, and Abraham is saying, well, of course, what if there's a hundred people that are good? Will you still destroy the city? What about ten? What about... And, and you, you hear this conversation, this, this, this beautifully portrayed intercession on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah and his own family, Lot and um, the, the members of his household that, uh, that live there. That's, that's the picture of submission that is so um, relevant and prominent to the theme of covenant. But, of course, for us to truly function as one, we go beyond submission to a surrender of our will. Because uh, the reality is, of course, for us to be one with God, we have to get to a point where obedience to God is foundational to all that we do. That obedience, of course, is framed out in the next book of the Bible, in Exodus, as we see God articulate the ten words that are, if you like, the framework in which freedom can be expressed, the Ten Commandments. But we see it introduced in the life of Abraham, who is the father of all those who will be faithful, and he and Sarah together are the initial model, the initial picture of what it means to be in covenant with God. And, and that, that covenant is a covenant where we finally have to come to a place of surrender, where we say, to be one with God means that his will is the most prominent will and not ours. And of course we see that in Genesis 22 when Abraham submits to the apparent request of God to kill his son, his only son, Isaac. We see this amazing and beautifully told story. A story in which slow motion and the close-up are first seen in all of human literature. You see them, as it were, taking a very quick sketch of the few days that it takes to get to the mountains of Moriah, and then everything slows down. And as Abraham lays his son on the altar, the text slows down to the point where it says, and Abraham reached out his hand and took the dagger. Everything has been made, as it were, breathless as we wait for what it is that might happen next. We zoom in on the, on the knife. We slow the action down to almost impossibly slow beats. And God, speaking through the, through the, the angel, says, don't harm the boy. Now I know that you're fully surrendered to me. So, there we see in the life of Abraham, and of course the rest of the story is quickly wound up after that. There we see in the, in the story of Abraham um, all that is necessary for us to understand throughout the rest of Scripture what it means to be at one with God. And that's why Abraham and Sarah are, as it were, the parents of all those who are faithful to God. As we see it unfold in Scripture, we see that covenant is about being one with the Father, having an identity that comes from the Father, and living in obedience to the identity that we've been given. Obedience is not something that comes to us out of cringing fear. It's not even something that comes to us out of a kind of a sense of moral duty. Obedience is behaving according to our identity. Obedience is about living out a life that reflects who we are. We're the children of God. Therefore, we should look like that. And so obedience is simply a reflection of our identity. 
And uh, it's tremendously important that as we live in covenant with God, and we express that covenant from God to a covenant with one another, that it flows from the Father through our identity into our, uh, our obedience. We see in the story of the prodigal son in Luke's Gospel, Jesus giving a parable of the covenant. Most of his parables are parables of the kingdom. But the prodigal son is a parable of the covenant, and as such is a parable about where the younger son understands his identity, but the older son does not. The younger son goes off to another country and squanders his inheritance. But this is what he says when he comes to his senses. He says, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to my father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a servant. And he's rehearsing that speech. You know the story well. He's rehearsing that speech as the father runs to him, having seen him from afar. He, he's brought in. The fatted calf is slain. The party begins. And all of the music and dancing comes to the ears of the older brother out in the fields. And he won't go in because of his anger at what it is that's happening. And he says to his father, this son of yours, this son of yours. He, he describes himself not in the same terms that he describes his brother. He says, I've been slaving for you my whole life. In other words, he has the identity of a slave and not the identity of a son. Because of that, he's a, attempting to approach the father through obedience, rather than approaching the Father through his identity as a son. You and I, as children of God, need to approach God not on the basis of the good things that we've done in the hope that we will find approval. We approach God on the basis of he's made us his children and therefore we have free access to him. And because we have free access to him and we live out that identity, then we live a life of natural, or should I say supernatural, obedience. Because as the Spirit settles in our heart, this is what Paul says in Romans 8, as the, as the Spirit settles in our heart, he tells us that we are children of God. And we cry, Abba, Father. And it's on the basis of that that we live out the life of obedience to God by the Spirit and not by the flesh. So, we see in the first story of the Bible the theme that will be articulated throughout the Bible. But of course, as yet, we've not mentioned the ministry of Jesus coming to teach us the depth of what it means to be at one with God and the cost that it would be to him. But we'll get to that in a moment. Let's first of all remind ourselves of kingdom or kingship. In the first book of the Bible, we get eventually in chapter 37 to the story of Joseph. And there, clearly articulated for us until the very last chapter, chapter 50, is the story of a young man whose pride got in the way of his relationships with other people. His brothers were prejudiced against him. And his father was continuously preoccupied by the affairs of his household. If Jane Austen had written the story of Joseph, it would have been pride and prejudice and preoccupation. Joseph has remarkable gifts. He has physical gifts and merits. He's handsome and well-built. He has spiritual gifts. He is able to see and understand the things of God because of his prophetic gifting. And even as a, young, as a young teenager, he has these gifts in great abundance. His brothers hate him. His father spoils him. He really has no chance to succeed well. He says to his brothers, you know, I had this dream and uh, you and I were portrayed in the dream as sheaves of wheat. And all of your sheaves are 
bowed down to me. What, what do you think that might mean? And his brothers look at him and express the theme of the story that will unfold from that point. Because they say this, do you intend to rule over us? Now, it's an interesting word, that, because it's first introduced as a theme and as a concept in, in chapter 1, when God says to Adam and Eve, go and be fruitful and rule on my behalf over the creation. Of course, they've lost that opportunity to rule and to represent God because they've lost the relationship with God. But God has now refashioned the covenant relationship with humanity through Abraham. And now his immediate descendant, Joseph, is going to learn what representation means. He'll learn the path of authority. He'll learn the path of kingdom life. Because what it is, of course, that Joseph learns is that authority comes through humility and that prominence is only found through the path of obscurity. He's beaten up, thrown in a well, sold in slavery to his cousins, the Ishmaelites, and uh, taken down to Egypt. You know the story well. You know how it was that Joseph was in the home of the head of security for Pharaoh, Potiphar, how, Pharaoh's, how Potiphar's wife uh, attempts to, uh, to, to draw him into an illicit relationship, and on refusal, she says that he's raped her. You know also that Potiphar most certainly didn't believe his wife, and probably it's because it wasn't the first time that this uh, particular thing had happened within the household. Of course, if he had believed her, then that would have been the end of uh, Joseph in those days, I'm afraid. But um, because Potiphar most certainly didn't believe the story, he separates his wife and Joseph and puts Joseph in the dungeon. Of course, he's the head of security for Pharaoh, and so he places him within the family compound in a place where the VIP prisoners would be kept. And um, on one occasion, when mo most likely... Pharaoh fell sick because of something that he'd eaten. It was assumed that there was a conspiracy within the royal court and the, the two possible perpetrators, the butler who would taste all of the food before the Pharaoh ate it and the baker who made the food were thrown into prison. The butler, the baker, but not the candlestick maker. The butler and baker were thrown into prison and you'll remember that one morning when the new trustee, Joseph, the one who's given responsibility of looking after the prison, um, he comes in at breakfast, he sees them downcast, he says to them, what is it that's the problem? They say, well, we've had these terrible dreams and we don't know how to interpret them. The butler has a dream of grapes being squeezed into Pharaoh's cup. The baker has a dream of a basket of of pastries on his head and birds eating it. Joseph says this to them. Tell me your dreams. I and God together will be able to solve the riddle. Tell me your dreams. He says to them, do not interpretations belong to God Tell me your dreams. Now, at the very beginning of the story, we have Joseph at the center of his universe. You'll remember that I mentioned the, the sheaves bowing down to him. Well, of course, he then goes on to share another dream with his father, where he says, it's as though, Dad, I'm the center of the universe because you and Mum, you're the sun and the moon and you're orbiting me and there are 11 stars and they're probably my brothers and you're, you're all orbiting me. It's, it's almost like I'm the center of the universe. That's the way that Joseph saw himself at the beginning of the story. By now, he's been captive and a slave for 11 years. That suffering, that hardship, that difficulty, the humility of his position has moved Joseph somewhat. It's moved him to include God at the center of the universe with him. 
Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Of course, the interpretation is that the butler goes free, the butler, uh, the baker loses his head. And that's exactly what happened. The butler forgets him, even though Joseph asks him not to, and doesn't remember him until Pharaoh has similarly troubling dreams of carnivorous cows eating one another and, and wizened wheat devouring lush wheat. None of the counselors of the royal court can offer Pharaoh any solution, not even his butler who stands with him day and night. But he remembers the young man who interpreted his dream. And so they bring Joseph two years after he saw the butler. They bring Joseph washed, shaved and clean before the king of this most powerful of nations. And Pharaoh says this, and this is chapter 41, verse 15. Pharaoh says this, he says, I've heard it said that you can interpret dreams when they're told you. Now this is the turning point of the story. What is Joseph going to say? Is he going to maintain his position as the center of the universe? Is he going to maintain his position of being at the center of the universe with God? Or has he learned his lesson? This is what he says. I cannot do it, but God can. God will give Pharaoh the interpretation he needs. In other words, he's now moved from the center of the picture. God is at the center of the universe and Joseph is there to wait his bidding. He gives the necessary interpretation. And Pharaoh, looking around his court, says, Is there anyone else in all of Egypt who is like this young man, in whom the Spirit of God resides? And with that, he makes him his emissary, his regent. He makes him his representative. He takes the chain of office from around his neck and puts it around Joseph. He gives him his clothing. He gives the ring of authority. He gives him the, the Pharaoh's chariot in which to conduct his business. And in all things except the throne, he is seen as the king. That's what representation is about. You function with the king giving you power and authority. And so we see here introduced in the very first articulation of the story of kingship or kingdom what will be seen throughout the Bible, which is that the king has authority and power, but the king gives authority and power. But who to? Well, because the king is also our father, he gives his authority to those who bear his identity, and he gives his power to those who live in obedience. The king and the father are the same person. And because we bear his identity, we carry his authority. And because we live in the lifestyle with the behavior that he's called us to live with, then we walk in his power. Of course, that then is the story of the rest of Scripture. Throughout the Bible, we see covenant and kingdom articulated in the in the great stories of the Bible. We see Moses, who is both prince and priest. The priest of the covenant, the prince of the king. We see David, worshipper and warrior, a worshipper, the natural position of someone in covenant with God, and warrior, the natural calling of someone who's representing God. We see the same kinds of life being portrayed in Queen Esther, who functions in covenant with God, but represents God in his kingship by her royal office. Sometimes in scripture, we'll see one of those, one of those themes lifted up 
in the life of the person in the story. In the story of Ruth, for instance, we see covenant particularly and beautifully portrayed. In the story of Deborah, we see kingship lifted up and beautifully portrayed. Sometimes in the prophets, you'll see both themes, but with one having greater emphasis because of the specific calling and the context of the prophetic ministry that the prophet might have. And so in, in Isaiah, for instance, you'll see both covenant and kingdom, but kingship is lifted up to the greatest extent. And then in Jeremiah, uh, the other great prophet of the Old Testament, you'll see covenant and kingdom, but again, it's covenant that's lifted up in greater prominence. All of these books, stories, prophecies, and pictures that we find in the Old Testament lead us to the one who will be called the Son of God, bearing covenant identity, and the Son of Man, bearing the royal calling to be Messiah, the Anointed One. So, here's Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, bearing in himself the full and final representation of covenant and kingdom. He comes to his baptism at the beginning of his ministry. And his, his covenant relationship is perfectly expressed. The father says, this is my son with whom I'm very pleased. This is my son whom I love with whom I'm very pleased. And upon him descends the dove. The dove descends upon him and John the Baptist says that he saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus and remain on him and he has the Spirit without measure. What we see in this, in this marvelous record of, of what happened there in the, the baptism of Jesus is we see the kingdom of heaven up until this point separate from the earth, only rarely represented in the ministries of the kings and the prophets. We see the kingdom of God coming to reside upon Jesus. We see the heavens being torn open. We hear a voice expressing covenant identity. And from that torn and rent heaven, which separates the kingdom of God from the kingdom of the earth, we see the third person of the Trinity who will always connect, perfectly connect, by the conduit of his presence and power, the kingdom of God, with the world in which Jesus is living. And so in Jesus, we see covenant portrayed. He says, I only do what I see my father doing. But we see kingship perfectly represented because he says if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God then the kingdom of God is among you he is the human representation of the kingdom of God now of course uh, the rest of the scriptures uh, in the New Testament will continue to articulate these two great themes again some of those books will lift up one theme rather than the other. Revelation lifts up kingship or kingdom um, very strongly, although covenant is there woven into the text as well. If you look at the synoptic gospels, the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, you'll see more kingship being described, more kingdom being described than covenant. Although, to be honest, you'll often see covenant in the subtext. You don't have to look very carefully to find it. But again, if you look at John's Gospel, you'll see much more of a covenant emphasis with kingship as the subtext. But wherever you are in the Bible, if you ask yourself these two questions, what's the relationship and what's the call to take responsibility for representing God, you'll always understand the verse, the chapter or the book that you're reading. Because they're always about those two things. And sometimes there's an emphasis in one direction, and sometimes 
there's an emphasis in another direction. But the Bible doesn't have to be a mystery to us. The Bible doesn't have to be this kind of artifact of, of high art that only the intellectual elite are able to somehow understand. No, the Bible is a love letter written from a father to his children. And it's about two things. It's about our relationship with him and how that affects all of our relationships with everyone else. And our calling to represent him and how that works in our daily lives and in our ordinary stuff of life. Jesus represents covenant and kingdom by revealing in his discipling work invitation, an invitation to relationship, and challenge, the challenge to go on mission with him, the mission of the king. Kingship or kingdom, I think I'll put kingdom back up there now so that we use the more familiar language. Covenant and kingdom are expressed throughout the ministry of Jesus, but in the way in which he creates disciples who imitate his life and carry on his ministry and mission, we see him bringing invitation and challenge. He calls them to follow him, and then he sends them to go on his behalf. The beginning of his ministry with his disciples is an invitation, come, follow me. The end of his ministry with his disciples is a challenge, go, make disciples of all people. Jesus is constantly calibrating invitation and challenge throughout his ministry so that the muscle of discipleship begins to grow and begins to develop. And the disciples, by learning from Jesus, are able to emulate the life of Jesus and to multiply his life as he calls them to do that by making other disciples. What we see, of course, is that those disciples, as they gather together, function as ecclesia, as the called out people of God. And that means that, um, that as they do that, they function in community. But it's a community on a kingdom mission. Over the years, Sally and I have um, pioneered missional communities uh, that many of you I know are leading and developing and innovating in lots of different parts of the world. A missional community is simply the way in which we organize our life corporately to reflect covenant and kingdom. Uh, because missional community has been, as it were, boiled down into a vehicle that helps churches engage with the mission of God, often where the mission of God has kind of uh, grown dim or has become uh, somewhat lost in the midst of uh, all of the ministry uh, that we get called to. Uh, we've, in recent years, uh, pointed out that this, this community is actually a family, and it's a family on mission. It's the family of God. It's not a nuclear family, and it's not a family that requires married people to lead it, but it does require spiritual parents. And those spiritual parents can be single people or married people. They can be male or female. But it's still the family of God represented in a group of people that looks more like an extended family than a nuclear family. Here in Paulie's Island, we have uh, a family on mission. We have a common mission together. We have common community rhythms and patterns. We pray and read the Bible. We worship. We listen to God together every day. Our life of mission is expressed in making disciples in every context that we have opportunity to do it. At the coffee shop, in the local supermarket, in the local schools, we're working in conjunction with those, those other agencies. We're working with all of the other churches in the area that we have uh, freedom to function in. And as well as that, of course, we're called to work alongside other churches in 
making disciples of their leaders and of their people so that they can multiply that in lots of other places. We're a family on mission, and as such, uh, we function as that missional community that many of you would recognize and represent. So there we are. I hope that that's uh, a kind of a beginning, and um, maybe we'll just attend to some questions. Um, I've got David in the room with me here. Um, for those of you who want to uh, follow the, 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 the line of questioning, um, on Twitter, it's, uh, I think, under hashtag Tom Live. And um, uh, other than that, I think, you, can, you, can they send it by other means as well, David? Just do that. Just do that. So we'll just send it through Twitter. That's great. Okay. So, David, what, uh, what, what we got, just to get me going? First question is, how does covenant and kingdom inform my goal of building families on mission? Ah, well, um, hopefully I just addressed that. That may have come up just before I started talking about that. But, um, but of course, it's, um, it, it's fairly straightforward if you create this kind of a matrix. Because, obviously, covenant is the basis of family. And kingdom is the basis of mission. In many ways, you find yourself functioning with family here and mission here. And together, we create, as it were, this vector as we bring together family and mission. Family, of course is on the covenant axis and mission is on the kingdom axis. These are the two realities and it's that quadrant that we live in of truly embracing family and truly embracing mission. One of the things that Sally uh, has, I think, helped me with over the years, uh, most particularly, is when she's really counseled me to understand that it's not family or mission. I can remember us when we were first married and we were thinking about kind of going out and doing our work in the inner city amongst the poorest uh, communities in Britain. And she said, well, yeah, but we're going to be normal, aren't we? In other words, we're not going to be one of these abnormal missionary families that leaves the children somehow to survive and um, kind of lays the family on the altar of the mission that we have. It's not family or mission. And um, we began by trying to do family and mission, which meant that we had to manage our time, we had to manage boundaries, we had to understand what it was that we were doing. And quite honestly, it was a good thing. It wasn't the, the full picture, it wasn't the complete picture, but it was a, a really good thing for us to uh, wrestle with at the time because the thing that we really needed to learn was the management of a household. And out of that came the teaching on the rhythm of life and the semicircle and all of that stuff. But as time went on, it was very clear that it wasn't family or mission. It wasn't even family and mission. It was family on mission. And with her inimitable style, Sally described it as moving as a pack. In other words, we've got something to do, and we're all going to do it together. Otherwise, we're not going to do it at all. And that's most certainly what's represented here. Um, we've not press ganged our kids to come and join us here in, in Paulie's Island. They've all gone off and done various different things, but they found their way back here with their spouses. And uh, some of them are actually beginning to um, have their own families. And they're part of, of course, our, our nuclear family, but, but we're all part of this wider family that is here in Paulie's Island. Most of us are members of the Order of Mission. And, um, and as such, we're functioning as a family on mission together. I don't know whether that's a, a way of answering it, David. What, are, what else have we got coming in? Uh, what are some practical examples of moving from embracing our identity to exercising the authority we have been given? Yeah. Um, 
Well, the, the, the practical the practical stuff is um, is to do with is to do with you know the, the normal warp and weft of life, I guess. I mean, I I, I reckon that um, I saw many more people healed. In other words, I saw the expression of God's authority in healing much more successfully when I began to really dial up the fact that I'm representing him not as some distant relative, but as his son. And, um, and as his son, I was only praying for somebody because I simply believed this, that their father and my father wanted them well. I, uh, I, I reflected on the things that Jesus said when he said, which of you fathers whose son asks for bread, and Jesus describes bread as healing when he heals the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. He, he talks about the bread only being given to the children and not to the dogs. So the bread of healing. So whatever the particular sustenance is that God's, that God's going to give, it's, it's about understanding him as our father. Which of you fathers whose son asks for bread gives a stone? If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, will not your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And so the, the level of confidence that comes when you're praying for the sick, simply because you know that you're a daughter of God, you're a son of God, and that you're representing the Father heart of God towards this other child who may be estranged from him, may know him a little, may know him a lot, but you're representing the Father in that identity. And in that identity, of course, you carry the authority of his kingship. So uh, there's a kind of practical example, and perhaps it's the more exotic example of healing, um, but uh, of course that would translate into almost every area of life. Any other questions, Darren? Um, how do we practice an integrated theology of covenant and kingdom and not be it too far emphasizing one at the expense of the other? Yeah, I mean, that's tremendously important. And um, I mean, as, a, as an order, we've, we've had to look at this um, even from a kind of global perspective. I think most certainly the first phase of our life was, was really quite organic. I, I really felt... Um, as the one who'd been given the responsibility of leading out the order, that the thing I needed to do was to take my hands off the order and allow the order to grow organically. Now, of course, uh, organic tends to function on this end of the continuum. And so, naturally, as we allowed the order of mission to grow organically, what was tending to be emphasized was... The covenant and um, of course uh, lots of the the kind of missional minded apostolic people within the order kind of got a little bit antsy a little bit kind of uncomfortable about this because they they said well wait you know we're supposed to be an order of mission and we're always talking about ourselves and we're always focused in on our relationship and um, and as we prayed about that as guardians and as leadership we began to sense that God was saying okay just move the emphasis away from covenant and the organic growth of the order and into kingdom. But of course, as you go into kingdom, then very often what you need to do is to organize. And um, organization is often commensurate with the necessary expansion of kingdom activity. And... Um, uh, you, you know, I think that it's that it's really a, a representation of what needs to happen in the local context. There will be some people who have a greater emphasis towards covenant and towards organic life. There'll be others who have a greater emphasis towards kingdom and maybe the kind of more organizational things that we need to do to deliver on our calling to be missionaries. Whichever, we need to see one another as a gift to our calling to live out covenant and kingdom. In other words, I don't think it's possible for us to do this alone. The only way for us to maintain 
a dual emphasis is to listen to what it is that God is putting into the heart of the people around us who've been called to be on family, to be a family on mission with us. And certainly that's that's true here. We've um, we've noticed that here that that just of late there's been a, a kind of a more of a call to the emphasis of of uh, kingdom activity in in particular ways, and we've seen uh, people come to us and get saved and various different things. And um, and you, you just have to attend to that. You have to listen to that, knowing that there are two great themes. You can then attend to that now. Another practical way that you can do that is to make sure that you use the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer addresses God both as Father and as King. The, the, the way that perhaps I would prefer it to be um, translated is this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingship come on earth as it is expressed in heaven. Now, what that means then is that is that the that the whole fabric of the Lord's Prayer is reminding us both of covenant and kingdom, because it's reminding us of Father and King. And then as you go through the couplets, the phrases of the Lord's Prayer, one emphasizes covenant, the other emphasizes king. And um, I think it's in leading kingdom movements that uh, that I kind of explain that more particularly. What else have we got, David? Anything else? Yeah. Um, what have been the most important predictable patterns you created with your kids in order for them to grow and be a part of a family on mission? Yeah. And that's uh, that's very helpful. What um, what that person is alluding to is um, is some work that we've begun to do recently for a new publication that's coming out called Family on Mission, where what we say is this that. Um, that family on mission is about having spiritual parents, having predictable patterns, and purpose. Well, purpose, of course, is the purpose that Jesus has given us, the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Spiritual parents, they're parents of natural children who live spiritual lives, or they're spiritual parents of supernatural children who are not the progeny, as it were, of your relationship. But, but whichever way, your spiritual parents who are calling a family to join you in the purpose that Jesus has given, and you're living out predictable patterns. The reason that you need predictable patterns is quite simple. All families need to have a sense of security. And security has been revealed down through the centuries and in all of the research that's really ever been done on the development of children and the development of successful, mature lives is always dependent upon predictable patterns. So a child that's nurtured with predictable patterns of, of uh, meal times and bedtimes is a child that will grow to greater security. Uh, they may uh, suggest to you by screaming and um, and challenging you on every turn that that's not the right way to go. But I can absolutely assure you, all of the research is in, and there's no doubt about it. Predictable patterns lead to security in children. Well, they lead to security in everybody. And so um, we as a as an oikos, as a, as a family on mission here, we pray together every morning at 8.30 until 9, and then on Sunday between 6 and 7 in the evening. Saturdays, we'll often have just fun stuff because it's our day off, and uh, we'll meet at the beach because we live near the beach. I know we're very grateful for that. Um, but, but we have these predictable patterns that you can build your week around and that you know are going to happen. Well, with small children, we always made sure that meal times were the times when the children could predict that we as parents were going to be with them. Now that meant sometimes that we had to have breakfast very early in the morning because breakfast was the beginning of the day and we always began together. And so we used to meet together for breakfast and from breakfast go out on mission to our various different locations. We'd pray together, we'd read the Bible together, 
would use simple and um, illustrated ways of engaging the children in that process when they were young. And, and as they got older, of course, they shared in that with us. And then in the evening, um, though it wasn't so hard and fast a rule, certainly for the first 10 years of their life, um, we had dinner together almost every evening. And that dinner time became not only a, a gathering for us, but a place where we could invite friends. Wednesday evening was always a, a night when the children would invite their friends to tea at our house, and uh, many of them came to, came to know Jesus because of it. Those predictable patterns actually began to flow into the lives of other people that our, that our family contacted. So just put simply, the predictable patterns that have helped us most are meal times, and uh, as you've heard me say before, it shouldn't be a big surprise to us that. Because if you take the mountaintop experiences and the meal times out of the Bible, it's about 50 pages long. Basically, everything that's important that happens in the Bible either happens on a mountain or at a mealtime. And we've got the opportunity of having meal times that we share together every day, so why wouldn't we use them? So meal times are the best predictable patterns. Now, uh, I mean, be more than happy to engage with you about uh, methods of disciplining your children where predictable behavior is tremendously important. In other words, you don't find yourself disciplining your children out of anger, but you discipline your children out of a, out of a pre-arranged, pre-described framework of behavior in which freedom can be expressed. But we can talk about that some other time, maybe when we do another broadcast. Any last question there? And time for one more. Um, this one is, how do we help people move towards a place of there is a God who can, rather than it's all about me? I, I really think that's a tremendously important question. Um, there is a God who can, and it's not all about me. That's really the journey of Joseph. And uh, if you go back to Joseph and look at how God took Joseph on the journey that meant that he was not the center of the universe. It was usually through difficulty and suffering. The people that we're engaging with will begin to go through difficulty and suffering, and it's in those times that we can, as it were, give a word that helps them engage with a God who loves them in every condition, in every experience of their life, and helps them to see that they're not the center, but that he is, and that he loves them. I think I should pray. We're right there at the end of um, our time, and so uh, it's been tremendous being with you. Thank you for uh, the responses and for the questions, but let's pray. Father and King, we ask that we would live out the identity that you've given us and the authority that you've placed upon us. And may we, Lord, represent you by our lifestyle, by our words, and by our actions. And may we, in doing that, give a picture of who you are, an invitation of what it is that you're calling us to, and gather many, many people into your family. And we pray this in the name, according to the character and identity of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.